white settlers occupied all the prime land. Obviously agitated by what was happening, the Gikuyu people formed a movement to fight for their land. Chinyasa would, however, not meet the expectations of the indigenous. This was the beginning of the Mau Mau movement. The irony of the 50s was that the international community viewed the imprisonment of Jomo Kenyatta as a greater atrocity than the British massacre of the Mau Mau. Kenyatta was finally released from prison after seven years. He was 70. He celebrated the occasion by serving his son, Uhuru Kenyatta. But was it Uhuru yet? Through those methods, Kenyatta, his family, and senior government officials acquired huge tracts of land as the place. Other peoples estimated the Kenyatta's to be worth approximately 150 billion shillings. I know you're wondering why this set is in black and white. I'll tell you why. This story takes place over 60 years ago. In fact, the protagonist in this tale is over a century old. He was born Kamau Wamwegai in the 1890s in Kiambu. His life would start with a tragedy, with the loss of both his father and mother. Kamau and his younger brother, Congo, would be raised up by their grandfather, Congo Wamagana, a seer. Kamau, in his book, Facing Mount Kenya, would refer to him as a magician. He even warned his readers not to confuse the role of his grandfather with that of a medicine man. The magician, he said, is superior. Perhaps that belief, as petty as it may sound, might be what influenced the young Kamau then and in his little life. At around 20 in 1910, young Kamau had had enough of following his grandfather around and taking care of his grandfather's head. So he went to school. Church of Scotland Mission Togoto. It was a Christian boarding school. He studied English literature, reading, and writing. The speaking came later, albeit with a heavy Gikoyo accent. However, with time and after a stint in England, he refined his spoken English to British standards. Kamau also studied Christianity. The conflict of the Gikoyo traditional beliefs with the new Christianity religion were not too much for Kamau to handle. He reconciled the fact that both religions have a major deity that they believe in, God, Guy, and that both religions believe in the communion with those who have already departed. The Gikoyo have their ancestors, the Christians have their saints. To put his new belief in practice, it came time for the young Kamau to be baptized. The missionaries that seemed to choose a Christian name. He had studied and loved the character of Jesus, but he knew he couldn't take the name Jesus. He could, however, take the name of Jesus' closest disciple, John, or Jesus' most tasked disciple, Peter, or both. So Kamau chose both names. He wanted to be baptized John Peter Kamau. Here, Iwezekan, the missionary told Kamau. The stubborn Kamau then thought of Peter's second name, the rock or stone, John Stone's Kamau. That too was rejected. But since he was too stubborn, they allowed him to use Johnstone. Thus, Kamau became Johnstone Kamau. 
Now in his 20s, Johnston Kamau was trying to find his purpose. He held several jobs here and there. A carpenter, a meter reader, a mason. Then 1914 came and it was time for the First World War. Young Kikuyu men were being recruited to join the British Army. Kamau refused to join the army. In fact, some historians claim that he even ran away from Dika all the way to Narok to hide among the Maasai who had refused to join the army as a community. Anyhow, his younger brother, Congo, joined the army for World War I. And that is the last of him that is known. While in Narok, Johnstone Kamau would fall in love with the place, the people, and their culture, especially the bedeled jewelry that Maasai usually don't. Backstreet Whispers even said that he even fell in love with a Maasai and Dito from Loita. He left his guineras in Loita, the Maasai says, and he still owes us dowry payments. That's according to them. But his first recorded love was Grace Wahoo. He married her in 1999 and had two children. The son, Peter Mugai, will feature again in this episode. So remember that name. The Kikuyus referred to the beaded Maasai belt as Kenyatta, and Kamau liked the reference, eventually getting accustomed to it as a reference to him. He dropped Kamau and adopted Kenyatta. I still don't know why he wasn't called Kenyatta, no, with a key. Some people say that he changed his name to Kenya Ta, Kenya and Ta for Lamp. But we'll never know. After siring two children with grace and sowing his wild oats in Maasai land, Kenyatta's destiny would change in 1925 when he picked up his first tribal role as the leader of the Kikuyu Central Association. This would be the start of his journey to national leadership and international recognition. The KC opened the door for him to visit Europe first in 1928 and second in 1931. While in Europe, he stayed in England, but he visited Russia, France, and other places. While there, he studied English anthropology. In 1938, he documented and published the now famous account of the Kekoyo tribe in the book Facing Mount Kenya. On the book's cover, a young Johnstone Kenyatta is pictured donning a traditional Kikuyu attire and holding a burning spear. The burning spear represented his aggression towards the cause of fighting for his natives against the British rule. A burning spear in Kikuyu is known as Jomo, hence Jomo Kenyatta. Throughout history, leaders have adopted names to match their new identities. Mahatma Gandhi was born Mohandas Karamchad Gandhi. Haile Silasi was born Ras Tafari Makonen. And even the Catholic popes have to pick a new name to match their new status. And this is how Johnston Kamau, my guy, became Zomo Kenyatta. A new name, new status. While in England, he met and married his second wife, Edna Clark, 1942. He also bore a son with her, Peter Magana. See how he loved the name Peter? Kenyatta returned to Kenya in 1946 after 15 years in Europe to actively participate in the movement for reclaiming the native's land from the British. In his book, Facing Mount Kenya, Kenyatta claimed that he was an expert on matters concerning land. I quote, I can claim to speak with more than ordinary knowledge. The Gikuyu have chosen me as a spokesperson before more than one land commission. Because anyone who wants to understand the Gikoyo problems, nothing is more important than the grasp of the question of land tenure. For it is the key to the people's life. It secures for them that peaceful tillage of the soil which supplies their material needs and enables them to perform their magic and traditional ceremonies in undisturbed serenity facing Mount Kenya. Fast forward, 
The Kenyatta's today are estimated to own more than 500,000 acres of land, while most of those that he was agitating for remain landless and poor. Kenyans still fight amongst themselves for what the Dungu Land Commission calls historical land injustices. It therefore turns out that Kenyatta could have committed the greatest scam against Kenyans. Or was it magic? One moment he had nothing, then boom, 500,000 acres. He prayed facing Mount Kenya, but he stole facing away from Mount Kenya. The Berlin Conference, the scramble for Africa. I will break this historical event in simpler terms so that I can avoid sounding like your high school history teacher. Infamously, delegates from these 14 countries met in Berlin, Germany. Before then, they were conflicting on trade and exploitation on what they considered a virgin continent, Africa. So they decided to agree on how to exploit Africa. Like a pack of greedy wolves, they decided to draw dice and see who gets what part of the game that they had just hunted. This is how the content looked in 1914. So Great Britain's dice fell on Kenya and other East African nations. So the colonizers started coming in, some armed with weapons, others with Bibles. Understand, in the late 1890s, the whole of Kenya had a population of less than 2 million people. There was no organized national government, only tribal leaders. But those keen in history will tell you about King Nabongo Mumia of the Wanga Kingdom. The sparse population density and a lot of unexplored land made the British to think that Kenya was a waste and an unoccupied land. Without a proper governance, an organized military, and still using indigenous methods, the natives were unable to resist the British occupation. The Europeans basically used the doctrine of discovery, a unilateral decree of international law issued by Pope Alexander VI in 1493 that categorized indigenous people as subhuman because they were not Christians and treated their land as unoccupied and available. But it was predominantly outright theft, enforced by violence and a method of colonial land and resources control. In 1663, by a decree from King Charles II, the British re-emphasized this practice and eventually ended up in Kenya. Joe Hamisi, in his book, Looters and Grabbers, notes that in the early 1900s, Europeans began to stream into the country at the invitation of colonial government and were allocated the most fertile land upcountry in areas where the, for generations Africans had farmed, grazed animals, and practiced their customs freely. The consequence was that the indigenous people were driven to low-density areas unsuitable for agriculture with low rainfall, uh, poor soil, and absence of pasture. Those who didn't find a place to settle became squatters in white farms or worked as laborers for the Martians. To put it in perspective, a report of Kenya Land Commission of 1933 stated that the Kikuyu had a land area of 27 million acres, while the Maasai's had 38 million acres. But after the colonizers came in, the indigenous tribes were evacuated to reserves of less than a hundred of what was taken by the colonialists. The colonialists' idea was plutocracy. 
a state of the wealthy, white wealth. It was Hugh Cholmodley, third Baron de la Mer, who came to explore Kenya first during a hunting trip. He was also one of the people responsible of influencing other Britons to come to Kenya for the free land. In 1901, Delamere got a grant of over 100,000 acres for grazing in Molo. He got 45,000 acres at uh, Soisambu Estate on Lake Elementata and over 12,000 acres in Naivasha for grazing and agriculture. If you remember, in April 2005, Thomas Cholmodley, a great grandson of Hugh Cholmodley, shot and killed a Kenya Wildlife Service game ranger on his ranch. He claimed self-defense, and the murder case was dropped before going to trial. Then, in May of 2006, he shot and killed a poacher on his Zoisambu estate near Lake Naivasha. He was acquitted of the murder, but found guilty of manslaughter. He died in 2016. Thomas' son, Hugh, is now the heir apparent of the Delamere Empire, the constant reminder of the colonial invasion for over 100 years. Other settlers included Karen Blixen, a Danish woman with over 6,000 acres land at the foot of Gong Hills. In 1905, 3,000 Britons arrived by ship and were allotted as much of prime land each as far as their desires allowed. In 1914, after the World War I, thousands of servicemen sailed to Kenya and were allotted 160 acres each all over Kenya, from Fort Hall, Moranga in central, to Londiani in the Rift Valley, across the plains of the Maasai land and along the beaches of the Indian Ocean. White settlers occupied all the prime land. There is a website, a fantastic website called Europeans in East Africa. It details extensively all the whites who occupied Kenya and all the property they grabbed. Check it out. The White Islands became the center for colonial habitation and what will be our reference of the Kenyatta land fraud. Perhaps the picture could be more vividly drawn by Gogi Wadiongo, who grew up in the late 40s and early 50s. I quote, I grew up in a small village. My father with his four wives had no land. They lived as tenants at will on someone else's land. Sweetened tea with milk at any time of day was luxury. We had one meal a day, late in the evening. Every day the women would go to their scruffy little strips of shamba, but they had faith and they waited. Just opposite from the ridge on which our village was, were the sprawling green fields owned by the white settlers. They grew coffee, tea, and pyretrum. I worked there sometimes digging the ground, tending the settlers' crops, and this for less than 10 shillings. Every morning, African workers would stream across the valley to sell their seed for such a meager sum of money. And at the end of the week or month, they would owe it all to the Indian trader who owned most of the shops in our area for a pound of sugar, maize flour, or grains. Thankful that this would silence the children's clamoring for a few days.
obviously agitated by what was happening. The Gikuyu people formed a movement to fight for their land. The Kikuyu Central Association. It is here that Kenyatta first joins the struggle. He was seen as an elite who understood the colonizer's language. He was also an editor of a publication known as Moiguidania, published by the KCA. Other tribes had just resistance associations as well, like the Taita Hills Association and the Ukamba Members Association, also the Kipsigis and the Nandis. An interesting fact, the Maasais didn't resist at first. In fact, they signed a formal agreement with the colonial government and gave up rights to their land. The agreement read, We, the undersigned, being the libons of clans of Maasai, have of our own free will decided that it is for our best interest to remove our people, flocks, and herds into definite reservations away from the railway line and away from European settlements. And in conclusion, wish to state that we are quite satisfied with the foregoing arrangement and we bind ourselves and our successors as well as our people to observe them for as long as the Maasai as a race shall exist. Kenyatta was first sent to the UK in 1928 by the KCA to present the Kikuyu land grievances to the colonial office. He did not succeed at that, and he returned to Kenya two years later. Then he left for the UK again in 1931. He was 40 years old. He stayed there until 1946, when he was 56. 15 years. He spent the time studying, engaging in street protests, and attending political rallies. He met with other future nationalists like Kome Nkuruma of Ghana, Kamuzubanda of Malawi, and Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. It is then that he wrote the book Facing Mount Kenya and married his second wife, Edna. Together they had a son, Peter Magana. Kenyatta was tall, perhaps 6'2". When younger, he was slim and athletically fit. But with time, he grew imposingly big. At one time, he was nicknamed Jumbo. He was a good orator and a remarkable public speaker. He purposefully ensured that he was the center of attention. He dressed better than everyone, had a fine taste in wine, and to every man, he knew how to present himself. He had, however, unknowingly picked British traits that he replaced with some of his indigenous roots. Flamboyant extroverted, a showman, sometimes quick to anger, a statesman, and a symbol for the African rebellion against the British. Or was he? Meanwhile, in Kenya, the KCA and other tribal organizations had been banned by 1940. The first attempt to have a national political outfit was in 1944. The Kenya National Union, led by Harry Duku, Duku and James Kishoro. This coincided with the return of Kenyatta to Kenya in 1946. Due to his popularity, he ascended to the top leadership of KAU. Kenyatta would, however, not meet the expectations of the indigenous. As much as he was a good orator, he failed to attain any significant reforms or redress of grievances from the colonial authorities. This shifted the political initiative to younger and more militant figures within the native Kenya trade union movement. This was the beginning of the Mau Mau movement. A secret central committee was formed and a decision was made to set up a clandestine guerrilla base in Mount Kenya and Abadea Mountains. While everyone else was upset by the continued British occupation, Kenyatta met with the new governor of Kenya, Philip 
Mitchell, and in March 1947, accepted a colonial post on an African Land Settlement Board. He also took a job at Koinange Independent Teachers College in Gidungori. It was owned by the legendary Bio Koinange, son of the paramount chief Koinange Wambio, the then pre-colonial leader of the Kikuyu community. The brotherhood was so good that Kenyatta married Koinange's sister, his third wife, Grace Wanjiko. Kenyatta's gradualist and peaceful approach contrasted with the growth of the Mau Mau uprising. Armed guerrilla groups began targeting the white minority and members of the Kikuyu community who did not support them. Kenyatta wanted dialogue with the colonialists or an intellectual approach like he had been trained in the UK. And although he publicly denounced the Mau Mau, the KAU leadership formed a secret central committee devoted to direct action, more militant action. It is hard for me to state outrightly how Kenyatta was a liberation hero. It would seem at this juncture like he was playing the colonialists. On one hand, supporting the Mau Mau, on the other hand, supporting the colonial rulers. Did he wear a velvet glove to conceal his iron fist while at the negotiating table? Did he control the Momo secretly? The people loved him. They rallied behind him. The Momo oath was administered in his name. In the book, Rethinking Momo in the Colonial Kenya, the author notes the following incident. However, when it became quite apparent that the government was about to declare a state of emergency in late 1952, on August 15th, Waruhu Itote, or General China, went along with eight other young men to see Kenyatta in his Gatundu home. When briefed by Itote about the decision to launch a military campaign, Kenyatta said, Look, my sons, you have come to me because you want to select some young people to work for your country. But you must realize that to be a leader is not an easy role. You do not become a leader simply because someone points at you and says you will be a leader. Those who are equipped to lead our people must know in their hearts. They themselves must be the first to recognize that they possess the qualities and determination that is needed. And further, some of you too will be imprisoned. And some of you will be killed. But when these things happen, my sons, do not be afraid. Everything in this world has to be paid for. And we must pay for our freedom with our blood. Finally, Kenyatta turned to Itote and addressed him. You learned many things in the army, my son. And now you can lead our people. If you had died in Burma, no one would have remembered you, for you are fighting for the British. But should you die tomorrow in your struggle, you will die for your own people and your name will live in our hearts. For Momau, Kenyatta was a powerful symbol of resistance and a messiah. There was in fact a prayer in early 1953 when the cruel bombardment of the Momau in the forest by the colonial forces had been testified. This is the prayer. Oh, our God, do not let us be defeated. If they defeat us, they have also defeated you. If they are defeated, you have defeated them. They are robbers and thieves who come as friends, but are now more like the Arab and the Camel. We pray that you will lead us as you led your servant Moses and the children of Israel across the Red Sea from Egypt. Guide our Messiah, Mze Jomo Kenyatta, wherever he is sent by our enemies and guard his life. We are here fighting for both land and freedom. Look down in mercy and help us to overcome our enemy. But his actions after independence would be more confusing to an independent observer. Keep it here. He knew that Kenya needed stability, not a new upheaval. He overruled the radicals. He had no place for Mau Mau. 
He ordered the few fighters left in the forest to come out. Kenyatta gave them nothing, but greeted them as heroes. In 1950, Dedan Kimadi Washuri became secretary to the KAU branch at Obkalao, which was controlled by militant supporters of the Mau Mau cause. The Mau Mau began as the Land and Freedom Army, KLFA, a militant Kikuyu, Embu, and Meru Army, which sought to reclaim land. Dedan Kimadi was the senior military and spiritual leader. He, along with Baimungi Marete, Musa Mariama, General China, General Gatunga, and Modoni Kirima were the main field marshals. In 1951, as the Land and Freedom Army was making waves on the ground, Kenyatta was the vice principal of Koinange Independent Teachers College. He was 60. Then he met a young, beautiful student at the college. She was the daughter of a prominent chief, Muhoho Wagadeta. Her name was Gina Moho. She was 18. This was a gift to Kenyatta because his status amongst the Kikuyu was rising and also because he had lost his third wife, also a daughter of a paramount chief, Koinange Wambiu. On 3rd October 1952, Maumau claimed their first European victim when they stabbed a woman to death near her home in Dika. Six days later, 9th October, Senior Chief Warohu was shot dead in broad daylight in his car, which was an important blow against the colonial government. Warohu had been one of the strongest supporters of the British presence in Kenya. His assassination gave Evelyn Berlin the final impetus to request permission from the colonial office to declare a state of emergency. Shortly after, Operation Jock Scott took place. British troops suspended African political leaders and rounded up suspected Mau leaders. Political and tribal unions were banned. 200 people, among them, the famous Kapenguria VI were arrested. Kenyatta was arrested, was driven to Nairobi. He was taken aboard a plane and flown to Lakitong, northwest Kenya. He was together with Bildad Kagia, Fred Kubai, Paul Ngei, Aching Oneko, and Kongo Karoba. The Kapenguria VI were put on trial. Colonial authorities believed that detaining Kenyatta would help quell the civil unrest. But the authorities, though they knew too well that Kenyatta was not involved in the Mau, they were nevertheless committed to silencing his calls for independence. Ironically though, this only made Kenyatta more popular. He was more popular to the masses as the Zohima Zomato. Kenyatta was finally sentenced and imprisoned in 1954. But this opened space for a more intense Mau Mau uprising.
Dedan Kemadi is credited with efforts of leading a formal military structure within the Mau Mau. He convened a war council in 1953. The Mau Mau military strategy was mainly guerrilla attacks launched under the cover of darkness. They used improvised and stolen weapons such as guns, machetes, bows and arrows, and others in the attacks. They maimed cattle and, in some cases, poisoned. In addition to physical warfare, the Mau Mau rebellion also generated a propaganda war, the battle for the hearts and minds of the Kenyan population. Women also participated in the struggle. Their greatest contribution was outside the domain of actual combat. Nevertheless, a few women took to the forest as support wings and acted as transport signals, medical corps, and ordinances to their male counterparts. The British retaliated. They retaliated violently against the Mau Mau. They viewed them as a tribal insurgency of the Kikuyu, Meru, Embu, and other loyalists. In 1954, General China was captured and interrogated for 68 hours. He ended up revealing the secrets of the movement in exchange for his life. In 1954, the colonial government eliminated all Mau Mau suspects in Nairobi by detaining all Kikuyu, Meru, and Embu residents in barbed wire enclosures, which were the detention camps. Between November 1953 and July 1955, Heavy bombers were deployed, dropping nearly 6 million bombs in Mount Kenya and Odea forests. More than a million Kikuyus were held in enclosed villages as part of the villagealization program. Although some were Momo guerrillas, most were victims of collective punishment that colonial authorities imposed on large areas of the country. Thousands were beaten or sexually assaulted to extract information about the Mau Mau threat. Later, prisoners suffered even worse mistreatment in an attempt to force them to renounce their allegiance to the Mau Mau and obey the colonialists. Prisoners were questioned with the help of slicing ears, boring holes in eardrums, flogging until death, pouring paraffin and setting alight, and burning eardrums with lit cigarettes. The use of castration and denying access to medical aid to the detainees by the British was also widespread and common. A young Mau Mau activist who was arrested and became one of the camp leaders was Josiah Wangi Karioke, popular as J.M. Karyoki. He was a great comforter to those detainees who refused to confess and collaborate with the colonial movement. J.M. Remember that name. Another name that we shall mention in this line is Peter Moigai Kenyatta. The firstborn son of the first president was among the people captured and sent to concentration camps. But he switched sides while in detention. After confessing, he was sent to a river detention camp where he became part of a cruel group of loyalists who brutalized detainees and demanded their confessions. As described by Ian Cobain of the Guardian newspaper in 2013, among the detainees who suffered severe mistreatment was Hussein Wanyango Obama, the grandfather of former US President Barack Obama. According to his widow, British soldiers forced pins into his fingernails and buttocks and squeezed his testicles between metal rods. Ouch. 1956, Kimadi was shot and captured by a tribal policeman called Dirango Mao. How ironic that his name was Mao. Mao found Kimadi armed with a panga. His capture marked the beginning of the end of the forest wall. The image of Kimadi being carried away on a stretcher was printed in leaflets 
and is now an iconic image all over the world. Leopard skin jacket and cap, half disguised, half uniform, when they ambushed and wounded him. Police Corporal Wanjoni on the left was in command of the ambush, and tribal policeman Ndirangu on the right fired the shot which brought the terrorist leader down. 500 pounds was the price on Dedan Kimathi's head, and it's expected to go to the man who wounded him. For the Mau Mau leaders still at large are only small fry. Without Kimathi, Mau Mau's days are numbered. In the early morning of 18th February 1957, he was executed by hanging at the committee maximum security prison. He was buried in an unmarked grave. The details of the Maumau insurgency and the British atrocities are documented in the book, The Imperial Reckoning. I quote one of the excerpts. Numerous allegations of murder and rape by British military personnel are recorded in the files, including an incident where a native Kenyan baby was burnt to death, the defilement of a young girl, and a soldier in Royal Irish Fusilers who killed in cold blood two people who had been in his captive for over 12 hours. Barin himself was aware of the extreme brutality of the sometimes little torture meted out, which included most drastic beatings, solitary confinement, starvation, castration, whipping, burning, things I can't mention, and forceful insertion of objects into artifices. But Barin took no action. The sad ending of this part of the Mau Mau raises three distinct questions. One, why did Kenya not get an apology from the UK for atrocities committed during the 1950s? Yet, as recent as 2023 November, King Charles III visited Kenya and received a red carpet welcome by the local leaders. Question number two, why did the Kenyatta's and the Moi's government denounce the Mau Mau? As you will see in a few, it was the home guards and the loyalists who reaped most from the Kenyatta government. They held important positions in the provincial administration and gained political and monetary powers. Former Mau Mau fighters were left to obtain it, landless and jobless. Veterans were scavenging in towns. Most, including Kimadi's family, lived in poverty until death. And third, why was Nelson Mandela, the iconic symbol for the struggle against colonial rule, impressed by Deden Kimadi and not by Jomo Kenyatta? In his book, My Moment with a Lenzed, the author writes about a moment in 1962. Quote, he, Mandela, spoke with us for a good hour about the independent struggles sweeping Africa. The inspiration of having met leaders of Algeria's liberation movement and the need to step up armed struggle at home. He encouraged us to get physically fit, recruit the most reliable and daring cadres, focus on training and recognizance of targets and set up our actions. He stressed studying the methods of guerrilla warfare, such as in Algeria, Cuba and Cyprus, and referred to the importance of African resistance heroes such as Dead and Kimani. The irony of the 50s was that the international community viewed the imprisonment of Jomo Kenyatta as a greater atrocity than the British massacre of the Mau Mau. Calls for Kenyatta's release came from the Chinese government, the Indian government, and Tanganyika's Prime Minister Julius Nyerere. Komen Kuruma personally raised the issue with the British Prime Minister. Harold Macmillan and other UK officials. 
Resolutions calling for Kenyatta's release were produced at the All African People's Conferences held first in Tunis in 1960 and then in Cairo in 1961. Kenyatta was finally released from prison after seven years. He was 70. He celebrated the occasion by sharing his son with his fourth wife, Amangino, his son, Uhuru Kenyatta. But was it Uhuru yet? Kenyatta's magic of getting into positions was still working for him. Remember, in 1925, he was thrust into the leadership of KCA. In 1946, after returning from England, he became the leader of Kenya African Union. And in 1961, barely months after prison, he became the leader of Kano. Now that independence was imminent, the British knew that their over 60 year of unwelcome stay had come to an end. Now pay attention, because all the build-up was to lead us to this moment. In 1961, the British settlers started to leave Kenya. When they left, the Africans would start getting their land back, right? Hold on to that thought. See, Kenyatta was a sympathizer for the whites. A London publication of 1974 noted that Kenyatta sought to gain the confidence of the white settler community. In 1962, the white minority had produced 80% of the country's exports and were a vital part of its economy. Yet, between 1962 and 1963, they were immigrating at a rate of 700 per month. Kenyatta feared that these white exodus would cause a brain drain and skills shortage that would be detrimental to the economy. Mr. Kenyatta, some of the 60,000 European settlers here are frightened that their titles to land and their right to stay in Kenya may be thrown overboard when a Kenyan administration takes over. Well, I don't think they have anything to fear, pro providing that they behave as a good citizen. I, you. I think some of you have been maybe worried what will happen if Kenyatta comes to be the head of the government. <laughs> he has been imprisoned. Maybe he has been given trouble. Well, now, let me set you to rest. That Kenyatta has no intention whatsoever to look backward. We are not going to look backward. Have you found that since independence things have gone as uh, badly as you expected or better than you expected? Oh, they've gone better than I expected. On the whole, since independence, have things gone better or worse than you expected? Oh, far better. They've gone infinitely better than I thought they would. And who do you give the credit for that to? To Jomo Kenyatta and his government. Kenyatta sought to redistribute the land to people who could continue with the farming that the whites were doing. So the land scams started. The first one was the one million acre scheme. This was to be the reallocation of parts of the former White Highlands via smallholder resettlement schemes between 1963 and 1971. The official rationale and justification was sustain and indeed propel agricultural development as small and medium scale African farmers took over former mixed farms, including land that had been underutilized or abandoned by white settlers. Corruption started when scheme beneficiaries were selected by government officials and appointees at the district level. This meant that Kenyatta favored his own Kikuyu people by dispatching them to the Rift Valley against his own promise that lands belonging to one community would not be allocated to another community. This was to reward regime insiders. The eviction of Kalenjin and Maasai tribesmen from their indigenous land to give way to the Kikuyu was one of the biggest blunders the first president made. And this has led to periodic tribal clashes between the Kalenjins and the Kikuyu. 
Coast Province was also the site of large-scale conventional schemes in Lamu, Kwale, and Kilifi districts. These were designed to promote the immigration of our country settlers, mostly Kikuyu and Lu. Anger was compounded when established communities were displaced to clear the way for acquisition of private land holdings by members of the political elite or for the development of tourism facilities. The second program was called the 400,000 acre scheme and it was to transfer up to 100,000 acres of European land to Kenya every year for four years. But just like the 1 million acre scheme before it, the 400,000 acre land scheme too was manipulated by the rich. Kenyatta's family members and his ministers used it to accumulate land for themselves. While responding to a parliamentary question by the Machakus Northern P, Paul Gay, back in 1964, the government showed clearly that the new settlers were overwhelmingly Kikuyu, as can be seen by these numbers. The elites used several methods to grab land. They did it either through direct allocation by the president, contrary to the law, uh, illegal surrender of ministry and state corporation land, and that was followed by illegal allocation. Using those methods, Kenyatta, his family, and senior government officials acquired huge tracts of land as they pleased. They colluded with officials at the Ministry of Land and Settlement to destroy documents and created fake title deeds for pieces of land which they then sold to third parties. And the third scheme was called the Z-plot. This was where senior government officials and those favored by Kenyatta himself and later Moi were allocated 100 acres each plus a farmhouse. All that was required of the political elite was to identify a farmhouse and the land and apply to the Minister of Land and Settlement and the person got an allocation letter. The beneficiaries are as listed. What will surprise you is how much land Kenyatta and his family allocated for themselves. There was a thousand and six acres of land in Dadora and another 2,099 acres around Nairobi, 10,000 ranch in Rumuruti, 98 acres in Kikuyu Escarpment Forest and 1966 acres northeast of Nairobi. And to add to that list, in 2004, Dongo's report added, among other items, the following as belonging to Kenyatta. 50,000 acres, Gatundu. 24,000 acres, Taveta. 50,000 acres, Taita Taveta and the coast. 10,000 acres, Naivasha. 52,000 acres, Nakuru. 10,000 acres, Rumuruti. 40,000 acres, Endebes in the Rift Valley. Joe Hamisi in his book, notes, thanks to Kenyatta, what started as a frantic scramble for land at independence led to the present situation where 20% of Kenya's elite owns 65% of the 17% fertile land available. In 1963, the president continued to ignore Momo fighters' fundamental claims of a land redistribution. Worse, instead of creating a hero's day as some had advised him, 
in recognition of all freedom heroes and heroines, Kenyatta chose 20th of October of every year as Kenyatta Day to celebrate himself. The Mau Mau freedom fighters became non-persons. Their struggle was consigned to oblivion, and any mention of them was a taboo. On the first Kenyatta Day in 1964, he told Kenyans to forget the past, a veiled reference to the liberation movement. Remember JM Karaoke. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, Karaoke's relationship with Kenyatta became increasingly strained as JM became increasingly vocal in his criticism of Kenyatta's government policies and their results including high levels of government corruption, widening inequalities, and the unfair redistribution of land by the Kenyatta regime. So, on 2nd March 1975, J.M. Karaoke's remains were found in Gong Forest by a herd's boy. His hands had been chopped off. His eyes got shot. His face burnt with acid and left on an ant's nest. The system had taken care of him. In his book, Not Yet Uhuru, Oginga Odinga correctly predicted that the land resettlement approach would cause unemployment and criticized the acquisition of fast lands by individuals, including Kenyatta. He correctly saw that Kenya was overcommitting herself to debt and predicted that the British government would influence policy via lending. And he was accurate in his characterization of the emerging class of the political elite. He said that their interpretation of independence was that they should move into the jobs and privileges previously held by the settler. And he, Odinga, blamed them, the Kenyatta regime, for what he called prostitution of Uhuru. But the influence by the British would start immediately. Terence Governor was a British colonial administrator. As a colonial district officer in Kenya, he was responsible for six detention centers in Moya during the Mau Mau insurrection of the 1950s. But in 1961, Governor was appointed localization and training officer in Kenya and tasked with Africanizing the senior levels of the civil service in preparation for independence. He trained the top brass of colonial loyalists and home guards who served in the Kenyatta government. Some prominent loyalists that were trained by Governor and later joined the Kenyatta top administration were P.K. Boyd, uh, Eliud Mahihu, Isaiah Madenge, Joseph Musembi, J.M. Malinda, P. Shikuya, G. Gashati, and John Michuki. A study reported by the Scandinavian Institute of African Studies in 1974 showed that in 1960s and early 70s, the Kikuyus, totaling 20% of Kenyan population, estimated at around 11 million people, were disproportionately represented in 175 highest positions in the government that included the president and his cabinet, assistant ministers, permanent secretaries, PCs, DCs, as well as commanders of the armed forces and heads of prisons, police, immigration, and personnel advisors. Almost all heads of parastatals in the 1970 were from central region and majority of them from Kiambu. Kenyatta died in 1978. Koigi Wawamwere had this to say. While some people commemorate and celebrate the day President Jomo Kenyatta died, I don't. 
That day, I was in Kamiti prison, detained by President Kenyatta for fighting for democracy and freedom while he subjugated Kenyans to cruel regime of one party, one man dictatorship. While Kenyatta used to be my great hero that I nearly worshipped when he championed struggle for independence and I was a patriotic poor youth when he died, I, it was sad. But as a victim of his dictatorship, he was no longer my beacon and savior. On 22nd of August 1978, the only thing I celebrated was definite knowledge that now that Kenyatta, who had detained me, had passed on, I would soon be freed by whoever could become president after Kenyatta. Shortly after that, Moi will take over. Among the things that stood out in Moi's takeover speech, he said, Nitafuata nyayo ya mze. He was implying that he would do everything that Kenyatta did, follow all his steps, land grabbing, ignoring the Mau Mau, corruption, detentions, political assassinations. Moi would also protect all of Kenyatta's interests. Some people say that Mamangina was not only the first lady during Kenyatta's reign, but also during Moi. Remember, Moi was not married during his presidency. To show his loyalty, Moi even nominated Gina's son, Uhuru, to lead the party of his father. So this is how client 13173 came to be. The Kenyatta's are by all means the nation's wealthiest family. Today they bask in the limelight for their colossal business empire. Banking, insurance, media, hotels, sprawling agricultural land and the grand offshore accounts all over the world. Yet, Concealed within the labyrinth of tax havens and cloaked by an intricate network of bankers, advisors, and offshore service providers, their clandestine machinations have remained hidden to the naked eye and to the normal workings of the law. But all these would not have been known had it not been for the Pandora Papers of 2021. The grand spectacle of 2021, the year that the mysterious Pandora Papers were released and sent the Kenyatta's on the defensive. It was a tale that captivated the masses, a sieve plucked straight from the script of a Shakespearean tragedy. We knew they were wealthy, but not this wealthy. These papers revealed how the Kenyatta's and others hide their wealth in offshore accounts. In this extraordinary saga, the Kenyatta's sought guidance from the experts of international wealth expertise, the renowned Swiss bank union, Bankaire Privé, for who better to advise on the intricate of art of financial secrecy than the masters of Swiss banking. These sly foxes enlisted the aid of a Panamerian law firm specializing in the dark arts of setting up and managing offshore companies. The Kenyatta's were bestowed the distinguished codename Client 13173 by their Swiss advisors. They are in a league played by international kleptocrats, a secret language only the initiated can understand. In the Pandora Papers, the curtains were lifted and the truth was revealed. In 1999, Mrs. Kenyatta, Momangina, and her two daughters, Christina and Anna, conspired to create a shadowy entity known as Mildran International Limited, nestled cosily in the British Virgin Islands. The British Virgin Islands is part of the tax haven jurisdiction where the wealthy hide their loot. Here, anonymity is the name of on all offshore accounts. Alcogal graciously provided a registered office on the Grand Island offering their loyal staff to play the role of Mildran's puppet directors. Thus, a perfectly incognito company was born, veiling the Kenyatta's family with impenetrable secrecy. 
The surreptitious enterprise was ingeniously utilized by Mrs. Kenyatta and her daughters to acquire properties and investments all over the world. This includes a splendid apartment at the heart of London worth a staggering 1.3 million pounds. In the 1940s, Kenyatta was a struggling renter in London. In 2023, his family owns apartments all over London. This particular one was once rented out to a British Labour MP, Emma Hardy, but that is just one of what was uncovered. Not content with one feat, the UBP private wealth advisors extended their crafty reach to Mr. Kenyatta's brother, Moho. Together, they created another Panamanian creation known as the Crisel Foundation in 2003. Hidden within the offices of alcohol in Panama City, the illusions of an organization was manned by a puppet board members from a law firm. Its sole purpose to cater to the desires of Moho Kenyatta, with his son, Jomo Kamau, destined to inherit the spoils. Another BVI company held in Mr. Moho's portfolio had a valuation of $30 million in stocks and bonds as of November 2016. The Pandora Papers estimated the Kenyatta's to be worth approximately 150 billion shillings. More than 30% of this wealth is touched abroad. And more than 20 million Kenyans are worth less than Kenyatta's wealth. Until the next episode, I have been truly yours. Jeff Kafka.